hello. Welcome back to Habit Helps, a podcast of Creekside Community Church in San Leandro, California, where we talk about how habits build you and about how you can build better habits. My name is Jeff Bruce. I'm a pastor here. I'm joined by John Bruce, my dad, who is also a pastor here. Dad, how are you? I'm fine. Doing doing better than I deserve. Yeah. yeah. Me too. <laughs> Dad, you don't like small talk, do you? <laughs> on podcasts. On podcasts, no. You, you know, typically during a podcast, this first 10 to 15 minutes is just banter before we get into the topic, but that's not you. Well, these people are investing precious time, and so I don't want to waste it. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that because I don't have any question to ask you. I, um, <laughs> I, I'm still mourning the warriors, but, y- you know, I feel like... Uh, this was not their year from the very beginning. Straight out the gate, straight from the jump, straight from the punch, as it were. Yes, yes, yes. You kind of knew this thing was destined to fail. Well, I didn't. Um, I do now, but uh, I believed, and uh, my faith was crushed. (laughs) (laughs) So, Uh, Well, today we're going to continue our series, Smart People what Proverbs teaches about building habits. Dad, you and I love the book of Proverbs. We read it all the time. And what I love about Proverbs is how it helps us deal with life between the verses. No, that's good. That's good, yeah. The the Bible doesn't provide a verse that tells us exactly what to do in every situation. Uh, It's not like a science textbook or something like that. But what the Bible does do, and especially Proverbs does, is paint this picture of what a wise life looks like. And I think Proverbs shows us that living wisely is more of an art than a science. Yes. There's a a skill to it. And Proverbs paints a picture of a graceful life, uh, a beautiful life that works with the grain of God's universe. Yeah. And, And as we practice the way of life and those skills of living, we naturally will become more skillful in dealing with complex situations right. that, that we encounter. Now, that's good. I, I think of Proverbs, in addition, as, as if Jesus is full of, in, if in Jesus is all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, that Proverbs is a great description of how Jesus lived, hmm. you know, the Christ-like life. Yeah. So, so it's not, uh, it just makes it clearer and more, more concrete. Right. Yeah, so we're looking at, Proverbs and the kinds of habits that Proverbs commands. What to live a skillful life that works with the grain of God's universe? What kind of habits should we build? And we've talked about the habit of lifelong learning, how to be a learner. And, and today we're going to talk about the foundational thing Proverbs is about. Right. I think, which right. is wise people, smart people, they take God seriously. Right. So where'd you get that, Dad, in Proverbs? Oh, because you came up with the title, <laughs> not me. <laughs> Good question. Um, Proverbs one seven says, "The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge." And Solomon repeats himself in chapter nine, verse ten: "The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding." And so this is the whole theme, really, of the book of Proverbs that wisdom begins with what we think about our Creator. And so wisdom is the correct knowledge and right relationship with God. And I think this all goes back to the Garden of Eden, that the, the great lie that the serpent told Eve was that she could be wise apart from her Creator. And that's been our biggest problem ever since, is we think we don't need God to recognize reality, rather than God created reality, and the only way I can know reality is by knowing God. So I think that's why the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. I have to be in right relationship with God and believe what is true about God before I can know the truth about anything else. Yeah. Yeah, beginning is starting point. And right. you think if, you, if the trajectory is wrong at the beginning... You're going to end up way off. Yeah, I think about it like driving a golf ball. Uh, just a little deviation on the face at the tee leads to, you know, being way out in the woods. Yeah, in the oh, that's end. That's good. 
And, yeah. and, and that's why if you don't get the starting point right, even if it seems like you're doing the right thing, uh, you're going to end up um, in the wrong place. Right. Which is why Proverbs says a number of times, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is death. That there are things that just so seem so intuitively right, and this, of course, this is the way to do it, and yet they end in our destruction. Yeah. And, and, and that's why taking God's wisdom more seriously than my own mind, my own thoughts, is really the beginning point of living a wise life. Right. No, the sin assumes that we are capable of seeing reality for what it is, even though the evidence would argue strongly against that. Mm -hmm. God created everything, and so he's the only one who knows how everything is supposed to work. And so if success in life and happiness is all based on seeing reality and adjusting my choices accordingly, I have to begin with what the Creator says about how things work. That's good. And, and I think to get the starting point right, we have to get the fear of God right. And yeah. what does that mean to fear God? And I was thinking about it this week because there's an idea that kind of floats around there that, that I think needs to be dispelled. Mm -hmm. and, and the idea is that the fear of the Lord is a relic of Old Testament godliness or something like that. that right that in the Old Testament, uh, God was really scary and judged and punished, and so people needed to be afraid of him. But, you know, in the New Testament, God became Jesus and became really nice, and so perfect love casts out fear. We don't need to fear God anymore. Yeah. And now, I, all the theological problems of that aside, it's just a lazy way to read the Bible for, for two reasons. I think first, the New Testament talks about fearing God. Mary, yeah. in Luke 1, talks about God's mercy being on those who fear him from generation to generation. Paul yeah. says in 2 Corinthians 7 that we should bring holiness to completion in the fear of the Lord. You know, Submit to one another in the fear of Christ. Work right. out your salvation with fear and trembling. So the New Testament is perfectly fine with language about fearing God. Yeah. That's the first thing I'd say. Second thing I'd say is that um, the vision of fearing God that the Old Testament paints is far richer and and more multi-layered than uh, I think we might yeah. presume. Yeah. Uh, exactly. I, I, and, and Michael Reeves, he has a book called Rejoice and Tremble that's really helped me to see this, mm. but to show that there really is a difference in the Bible between just being afraid of God and fearing God. Yeah. Um, yeah. The demons know that God is one and tremble. Yeah. That's an ungodly fear. Yeah. Ungodly fear is fear that repels you from God, <laughs> that causes you to flee from God, even though you know he's big and scary and transcendent. That's yeah. an ungodly, sinful fear, actually, that'll cause you to suppress the truth about God in unrighteousness yeah. and rebel against him. Yeah. But, but then there are instances in the Old Testament where you see that fear actually is something that draws near to God. So... It's a trembling not just at his greatness, but his goodness uh, and his beauty, yeah. such that this is the source of all good, and I would never want to lose that. that. That's sort of the idea. I think of Jeremiah 33, when God says something like, you will, you will tremble over all the good that I do to you in the fear of the Lord. So there's this sense of just being overwhelmed at the beauty and majesty and goodness of God. And only fear can get at that sense because it's a visceral response of trembling. Uh, it's more than just awe, uh, but just the weight of God's reality so that, oh, I would, I would never want to go against or go beyond or go outside of, of, of the, the beauty and mm -hmm. greatness mm -hmm. of what I have in him. Does that, yeah, so it, fear draws near, it does not draw away. Right. I think is one of the big things I'd want to say there. Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. Yeah, that the, the, the uh, craven fear that you describe is still based on self and your own benefit and your mistaken benefit or what's danger. But I think the Old Testament would say fearing God and loving God are synonymous. Yes. Um, that they... This is just kind of a, a way of describing our entire relationship with God. It's taking God seriously. And because I take him seriously, I love him. Right. And I hope in him. And I trust him and, and all these different things. Yeah, Psalm 130, with you there is forgiveness that you might be feared. Right. And, right. and, and uh, 
Uh, I think it's in uh, Isaiah 11, the prophecy about the Messiah, that his delight is in the fear of the Lord. And so Jesus, where did he get his delight from taking God seriously? Yeah. No yeah. one lived in closer communion yeah. with God and had less reason to be sort of afraid and run from God than, than Jesus, and yet he perfectly feared the Lord. So I just want to get that out here now to get that that obstacle out of people's head to go, well, should I really fear God? Yes, you should. It yeah. is, it is uh, the biblical word, really, that sums up the proper response yeah. to God and who he is. You know, one of the, I tell the story all the time, but one of the great illustrations of that for me was when we were adding on to our house, and my friend Bob Knight and I were, were um, pulling wire and doing the electrical, electrical. And one day he stopped, and he said, you know, working with electricity is like walking with God. He says, if, if you obey the rules, it's perfectly safe. If you break the rules, it, it'll be lethal. Mm -hmm. And that had really helped me to see that electricity, we benefit greatly from electricity and how we use it. But if you use it carelessly, or if you don't obey the rules, it can be deadly. Yeah, and the reason it's deadly isn't because God's so bad, but because God's so good. Yeah. That, that there is just yeah. no goodness to be found anywhere else. Exactly. No, that was good. Yeah. Well, good. <laughs> that, was the, that was the thing I wanted to get out there, but you have more to talk about. So talk about it, Dad. What do you... That's the starting point. So now... Um, you know, there's two ways we could go. Why don't we fear God? Uh, and how do we practice the fear of the Lord? I, I think just the familiar Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is a great illustration of how we fear God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. So it, it, that says that fearing God is more than obeying rules. It is, it is a life of faith because the Bible doesn't give us a command for every situation. Right. More, it says, respond to who God is. And what that means is trusting him. The righteous shall live by faith. Uh, that Ultimately, what fearing God is is trusting God in every situation. And, and even when I don't understand, when I can't figure it out, God is bigger than this. I am going to relax and trust in him and walk by faith. And what trusting in him with all my heart, not part of my heart, not keeping the escape clause just in case God doesn't come through, but trusting in him with all my heart uh, means not leaning to my own understanding. And that's the great thing that sin nature does for us is to trust in our own understanding. We go back to Eve's problem of, of you can be wise apart from God. It doesn't say don't use your understanding. It's just don't lean on it. Don't depend on it because there are so many situations where if I go by my understanding, I will never do what God wants me to do. And uh, last night in our men's Bible study, we were doing Jonah 3. And that's such a great illustration because God tells Jonah uh, to go to Nineveh. And it's a huge city, 500,000 people. And, and he gives them a very simple sermon. It's not repent or perish. It is you will die in 40 days. <laughs> <laughs> and Jonah, his job is to go into the city and proclaim this to 500,000 people. And I'm sure he was thinking, how am I going to reach 500,000 people when we only have 40 days? And, and the city itself is, is three days across just to walk across it. And yet within the first day, Jonah's message has reached everybody because the, 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 the message People are talking about it, this strange prophet, this strange guy who probably is bleached white because he became a sign to the Ninevites, as Jesus said. And, and so the whole job is finished in a day. The whole city has, has repented and pled with God for, to, to save them, and God turns, repents of his um, plan to mm -hmm. wipe them out because they repent. Right. And no city in Israel ever repented that to that extent you know so it's it's pretty much of a rebuke to the nation of israel but yeah. just the fact that if, if jonah had like me tried to figure well how am i going to do that i don't think that's possible to do he never would have even tried it but he just obeyed and god did it all and and so not leaning on your own understanding but really just doing what god says to do is the essence of fearing god yeah we're so um I'm so concerned about outcomes 
and then and doing something hoping to control the outcome versus doing something to obey in response to God yeah and, and saying that is the wisdom and and I can't control the outcome and I think that that's so often why we buck against because uh, we don't see how this will work yeah exactly and I think it was I think it was Stanley Hauerwas who said something like Jesus teaching on the Sermon on the Mount it's it's not because this is what makes life work uh, so much as this is just the way life is. Yeah. This is just life in the kingdom and, and working with the grain of the universe. Yeah, exactly. Uh, in, 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 and uh, Jesus is revealing that to us and has the authority to do that. And I think that's a helpful way of looking at, at wisdom is um, what works or what we think is the most effective is always going to cut against God's way of, of doing things. And I know for me, it's always going to be more about controlling haste, efficiency, um, charisma, power, charm. And it's just, there's a way of life that God just cuts against again and again and again. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because that's what teaches me to trust him and to yield to him. Right. And, and he is so much more powerful and wise, et cetera, et cetera, than we are. His way is always going to be better than our way. And, but it's also going to be, we'll be blind to his ways in a lot of times because we don't see things from his perspective. Right. And we take too much on ourselves. And that brings us to the next part. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Rely not on your own insight. And he will make your path straight. And I think it's both straight in the sense of right and righteous and honest, upright, and also in the sense of making it smooth, um, making your way successful. And so the idea is, is that I trust God and step out on faith. God is the one who directs my steps. He is the one who makes my way straight. So acknowledge God as God and uh, live in light of who he is. Take him seriously, and it will make your way smooth and successful. And, and I'd rather have a straight way than a successful way. I'd rather have a, a straight way uh, than a comfortable way. I'd rather... Uh, be right than popular, mm -hmm. I think is the idea, because you're because joy comes from being righteous mm -hmm. and doing the right thing, ultimately, not from the outcome. And so I think it promises, take God seriously, and all of your efforts will work out the way you want them to in the, in the long run, yep. is the idea. So trusting in him with all my heart, leading not to my understanding, and he will make my way straight. I think that's to me, is kind of a good summary of what taking God seriously means. And so then I've got to ask, well, where am I not doing that? Mm -hmm. And uh, where am I relying on my own insight? And, and because we're all sinners, everybody will, can, will be able to readily see areas where they still trust in themselves, their feelings, their ideas, or their circumstances, or what other people say more than they trust in God. And that's why I think Listening to God's word is so important because we have to have something that builds our faith and feeds our faith because it's a completely different perspective than the perspective we get from our flesh and from the world. And that strikes me, if you're reading the Bible and God's the starting point, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding. It sort of inverts what we would, maybe I would intuitively do when I read the Bible, which is, let me find the thing that resonates with me and talk about that. Right. Versus... What's the thing that cuts against my thinking and yeah. focus on that, yes. right? If the Bible is for teaching, correction, rebuke, then until there's a tension between um, the, uh, the way that I am uh, thinking, uh, did you not silence your phone, Dan? You can take it. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, it's okay. I, yeah, so until there's some tension, um, th then I'm not at a point of really diagnosing the area where, where I'm leaning on my own understanding yeah. versus what God says. And I think it takes patience with the Bible to really get to the, the tension point where God's Word is exposing where I fall short or I'm just not thinking this way. Yeah. Um, you know, or where I, I think a great question to ask is where are the but what abouts when I'm reading the Bible? You know, but what about this? What about that? You know, so okay, good. Let's let's needle into that. So what is God really saying here? Yeah. yeah. And um and I and I think that's that's humility before the word is you're not looking for so much what stands out to me 
as uh, yeah, how I'll, does this correct my thinking? Exactly. We're not looking for where the Bible agrees with me. Yeah. But where I disagree with the Bible and then boring into that to mm-hmm. see, because that's the only way we become wise. All the ways of a man, not the, all the ways of bad people, but all the ways of everybody yeah. is right in our own sight. And, and we can't, I mean, look at the Pharisees. They knew the Bible far better than we do. And yet they were completely blind to what it was really teaching because they just wanted to listen to the part they liked. Uh, I've often used this illustration, but occasionally, just to quality check myself, I'll listen to my own sermons. And sometimes I'll be in the car listening to a sermon and I'll think, that is such a good point. And then I'll think, of course you think it's a good point, idiot. Like, you said it. You yeah. know, it's just like, yeah. and it's this, uh, it's this uh, affirmation loop. But all of us have that little preacher in our head all the time right. uh, that we're affirming and right. say, yep, that's the way life works. That's the, you know, we're listening to ourselves, affirming our own narrative about how life works, how, how things should be. And, and, and that's why it's not very fun to read the Bible. It's uncomfortable. Be- because you, you start to read the Bible and you think, oh man, this is not what I would have said. Yeah. This is not how I would have put it. This is actually challenging me. I have to wrestle with this. Yeah. Uh, and and it's it can be wearying. It can be challenging for that reason, but it's because it's not a reinforcement mechanism. It's not it's not just reinforcing the feedback loop that already exists in your head. That yeah. what exists in your head is all the ways of a man are right in his own eyes. I right. mean, how often is the the feedback loop in your head? Am I am I really doing the right thing here? I, is that the way I should go? You know, I, I you know for some people it could be, but often it's. There's a reinforcement loop all the time. No, this is the way you should go. This is what you should do. And, and, and that's what we're verifying with yeah. our actions. Yeah, no, that's good. Now, Proverbs said, he who gives heed to reproof acquires understanding. Right. Which that says to me, acqu- acquiring understanding is impossible without being corrected. Yeah. Yeah. Because if I didn't need to be corrected, there'd be no reproof. And so I need to look for where are the reproofs today? Where Where, where is what God says really at variance with what I normally think or do or act. Yeah, and it's um, it's a humbling thing. Yeah. And, and that's why we need the right perspective on the gospel and who God is. Yeah. Uh, that correction is not condemnation. Um, correction is very hopeful. Yeah, exactly. Uh, because it's coaching on, on what to do better. Yeah. And, exactly. and if we don't hear that correctly, we'll, we'll just get discouraged right. and, and despondent. Um, but it's so important, and you just see that throughout Proverbs, that reproof is really... That's why reproof is at the beginning of wisdom as well. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, uh, Tim Keller, the, the late Tim Keller, one of my favorite quotes from him is, it's not worth having a God who can't contradict you. Yeah. Uh, you know, if, you, if, you, you know if, if your God can't contradict you, you don't really have a God. Right. Uh, you have a God of your own making yeah. if they just reinforce everything you already think. But yeah. for one reason you know you're believing in a God who's external to you is that they can contradict you. It's not worth having a God unless that God can can actually correct what you're thinking. Right, right. No, I think in athletics you can see that there are some athletes who cannot pro- progress beyond what they're comfortable doing. But the really great athletes they can have a coach come along and change some aspect of their sport. In golf, for example, it completely changed their swing, and it feels so awkward in the beginning because it's so different. What they, but they practice diligently that correction, and as a result, it becomes more natural until they're able to exceed what they could have ever done because they were hampered by bad habits. And uh, that's true for everything in life. If, if you just go with what feels natural, what feels right to you, you're stuck. Yeah, you'll do exactly what you've been doing. And yeah. you get the exact same results. Yeah. And I think that's why for years I would just, I, I would pray about things I was sinning in and just expect, well, that's all I need to do. I prayed that God would change that in me. And so I've done everything I need to do rather than, than set my mind to obeying him in those areas and practicing righteousness on the things that he reproved me on so that I could become wise. Mm-hmm. It's good. So... Good. Any other thoughts? Well, the other thing is just that all this is foundational, that how seriously we take the Bible depends on how seriously we take God. And and ultimately, what I believe about God will determine whether I'm wise or I'm foolish. Mm-hmm. And that's not just for Christians versus non-Christians. There are a lot of Christians who don't take God seriously. 
But if I take God seriously, then I really take what he says seriously, and I do not want to, to disobey or violate because I know uh, that there'll be consequences that I don't, I, w- I don't want. And that gets to the, the determining question, you know, am I pleasing God in this situation? Is yeah. what I'm doing pleasing God? It's not so much that you're doing something to affect an outcome. Right. Right? You're, you're not parenting with this technique to get an outcome. You're, you're parenting in a way that pleases God. Yeah. You're, yeah. Not, you're not engaging your spouse this way because you think this is going to make a harmonious relationship. You're engaging your spouse because it pleases God. Exactly. And I think we have such an obsession with technique in our culture that, that we think, well, that, that the Bible gives us technique to affect outcomes. Yeah. But that's just controlling life. Yeah. God controls life. Yeah. Our job is to fear him and please him, and then he works things to our advantage in his timing. Uh, it's, a, it's a fundamentally different way of looking at life. Yeah. And if, if my job is to control outcomes and control life and control success, I'll never do what God wants me to do with my kids, with my spouse, at work, with my money. Uh, there's all sorts of areas where what is clear in the Bible is not natural to me. Right, right. No, it's, it's easy to make yourself the center of the universe. And God is just one aspect of the universe to control. And, right. And, and to get on his right side and, and do things because it'll, have, it'll benefit me. Rather than turning it around is, no, I'm in God's universe. And my job is to please him mm-hmm. and let him take care of the outcome. Yeah. And that's so much free, more freeing when you get to that. Because um, you, you can walk by faith in him. And, and it... In uh, Romans 1, where Paul talks about the wrath of God is revealed from, uh, from heaven against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men who suppress the truth, the truth about him, in ungodliness, they did not acknowledge God or give thanks. And that's really what we're talking about, acknowledging God. Mm-hmm. Just in everything, I take God seriously. So what do I know about God that should shape the way I do this or feel about this or whatever? That's acknowledging God is bringing God into my knowledge, is that he is the North Star. Here's, he's the one who determines what I do and what is right and wrong. And uh, rather than thinking I need a verse for everything before I know what to do. Yeah. And so if you're frustrated with your kid, say, okay, well, what would please God? Yeah. yeah. If you're in a conflict with someone, okay, well, what, what would please God in the next thing that I do? I, that's it's the only question to ask. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and you actually don't, you're not responsible to do anything more than that. No, no. No, the righteous man should live by faith. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. It is good. <laughs> I think it's biblical. I yeah. hope so. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Dad. Thank you, Jeff. Good reminders. Listeners, thank you. Um, you know, maybe not as practical, but foundational, because, again, if we get the starting point wrong... All these habits and skills can just be sort of life hacks rather than really done by faith yeah. in response to the greatness and goodness and supremacy of God. Yeah. So thanks. We'll be back again, you know, soon, probably. We always say soon, but I think we will be back soon. So we'll see you soon. <laughs>